so I'll be telling you about uh, engineering of fluorescent proteins for multiple uses in biology. Uh, so I think I'll start with a story that we all know very well. Um, green fluorescent protein was discovered by Osamu Shimamira in the Acoria Victoria jellyfish. Uh, and um, you know, it was cloned by Doug Prasher and, uh, and my postdoc advisor, Roger Chen, uh, then uh, did a lot of the work characterizing the, the chemical biology of green fluorescent protein, understanding the chromophore maturation and, and wavelength tuning. Uh, and uh, Marty Chalfi showed that all we needed to do was express the gene in any heterologous cell and we would get fluorescence. So this is something that we all take for granted now. It's almost uh, 30 years ago, amazing how time flies. Uh, and you know, work by Rogers Lab and other labs had, had shown that you can tune the fluorescent protein emission wavelengths to span a visible spectrum. So these are all tools that we use nearly every day in biology. Um, I'll just tell you a little bit about how our lab got started with fluorescent proteins. Uh, just one quick example. Uh, one, of our, one, of the first, uh, one of the first goals of the lab when it started about 14 years ago was to redshift fluorescent proteins. And the, um, and the idea was uh, one, one, one reason you might want to redshift fluorescent proteins was to do easy four color imaging. Uh, that is, if, if you had uh, cyan green and orange fluorescent proteins, maybe you can have a far red fluorescent protein to the right. Excuse me. And then uh, that's on the excitation side. On the emission side, of course, it'll be, uh, it'll be a far red fluorescent protein to the right of the orange fluorescent protein. Uh, so we did this uh, just to give you an overview of how we, how we work with fluorescent proteins. We did this initially by site-directed targeted mutagenesis, uh, taking an example from, uh, from YFP. So it's known that in YFP, you can redshift uh, compared to GFP by creating a pi pi stack using a tyrosine residue. Uh, so we, we attempted similar things with red fluorescent proteins. Uh, what ended up working was a tryptophan uh, pi pi stack on the other side of the chromophore. Uh, together with another with other amino acid changes to to allow this protein to mature uh, and that was a protein called maroon uh, and we showed that um, maroon indeed uh, did have a far red um, uh, did have a red excitation at a, a peak around 610 nanometers and a far red emission with a peak a broad peak between 650 and 700 nanometers and this allows us to do very easy four color imaging with just standard filter sets uh, using cyan, uh, a yellow green, the clover GFP that we also in, uh, developed, uh, an orange fluorescent protein, and now this far red maroon. And just an example of what you can do with it. So, well, first of all, we show that you can easily uh, develop, uh, you can easily use filters to have orthogonal four color imaging. Uh, and then what we decided to do with it was uh, if you want to image four things, then nice four things to look at uh, were the four stages of the cell cycle. Uh, and Asushi Miyawaki had developed a Fuji reporter, I'm sure some of us here have used it, uh, where, one, uh, where the G1 phases are labeled with uh, one fluorescent protein and all the proliferative phases, G, uh, S, G2, and M, are labeled with another fluorescent protein. So we added uh, maroon as a, as a marker for mitosis, uh, where the mitotic uh, condensation of the, of the chromosomes is very easily seen. And then to get the fourth stage, uh, we, we developed a SG2M transition reporter using a fusion of SLBP. Uh, and we show that uh, at the end of S phase, this uh, SLBP um, uh, is degraded. So that gives us now four phases uh, that, that can be seen. Uh, basically in G1, you have a high, uh, high MKL2. Um, it, at the G1 S transition, you start um, expressing clover. Uh, and then at the SG2M transition, you lose uh, M turquoise expression. And then in mitosis, you can see the maroon. Uh, this is what it looks like in real time. Uh, so we start with uh, one cell. Uh, right now it's undergoing mitosis, as you can see on the right. And then um, uh, MKO2 is, is, is developing. That means it's in G1. Um, SLBP is expressed in G1 as well. When we enter S, um, the clover geminin protein comes up. And now when we enter G2, um, you lose the expression of SLBP. So this cell is going to G2, followed shortly by the cell on the right. Um, so the cell on the right is going to G2. And now you get mitosis. So um, this is a very old story. I just show it as an example of engineering fluorescent proteins for its basic characteristics, in this case, the, um, the wavelength. OK, next slide. Um, Lydia, I may return this to you because I think it may be out of battery. So, um, 
I'll just leave it here. I'm, I, I'm just going to use the, uh, the pointers on my computer. All right, so, so the stories I'll tell you about today are actually, um, oh, thank you very much. Thank you, everyone here is so well prepared. Um, right. So the stories I'll tell you about are, OK, well, oh, there's a switch. Thank you so much. OK. So the two stories I'll tell you about today are voltage imaging with GFP, which is, I think, represents an extreme case of fluorescent protein engineering. Uh, and spatial temporal control of recombinant and endogenous proteins with a GFP. And um, then the second story is actually something that we've never presented in public, so you will, you will see for the first time. So starting with the first story, um, Roger's lab also proposed that, that you, can, you can engineer fluorescent proteins to sense analytes. Um, and this is a story that all of us are also very familiar with, um, but this goes back to a 1999 paper where uh, they proposed the circular permutation and the fusion um, in different topologies uh, could all be used to generate uh, reporters. And shortly thereafter, um, a famous reporter was developed based on one of those topologies, and that reporter is GCAMP, uh, which is a green um, calcium modulated protein. And what it is is a circularly permuted GFP, where GFP is um, the coding of GFP begins at position 149, which is very close to the chromophore. Uh, then goes to the old C terminus, uh, is linked to the old N terminus, and then ends at 144, again close to chromophore. And that allows the attachment of N13 and commodulant domains, uh, which bind to each other in the presence of calcium. Um, and this is actually a crystal structure of, of GCAP, and we know a lot of, uh, we know very in high detail why it works. Um, and, and again, this is a calcium sensing protein, so here we just see that with calcium. Um, the, uh, the excitation and emission uh, wavelengths uh, ex intensity go, goes up. Oh, okay, so I guess the movies will not play, but that's, uh, that's all right. So if we, basically, we know this works because um, the two proteins, Kamaja and M13, bind to each other and then um, seal up the side of the barrel and allow for uh, the, pro the depronated chromophore to be stabilized. Uh, and it's the depronated state that's bright upon excitation at 488 nanometers. Okay. And, um, and this has become very popular in this neurosciences because now you can visualize neuronal activity by, by using calcium as a proxy for neuronal action potential firing. And so this, this is much better than electrodes. It's non-invasive. You can image at a distance. It is, um, it's better than dyes because you can image the same neurons over and over again. Uh, you, can, you can image genetically defined neurons. Uh, so these are all, of course, um, advantages of using a GFP-based reporter versus a chemical dye or, or an electrode. So I think the movie is probably not going to play. Oh, great, it will play. Um, and so this is just a great example I pulled off the web of, um, of one of the great uses of GCAMP. So GCAMP will tell you which neurons are firing at a particular time. Uh, here a mouse is moving along a track, and you can see that as it moves um, as it moves past this triangular object, this neuron will fire, but only when the mouse moves down. Uh, and these are, these are neurons that are being visualized in the hippocampus. Um, these are place cells, right? They are encoding your perception of space um, as you learn a new environment. And um, you know, this, this kind of approach is now very common in neurosciences, just to see which neurons are active when. But there's a, uh, there's a problem with calcium indicators when it comes to really understanding the computation that lies behind uh, neuronal circuit activity, and that is, there are two things that are limit that are limitations of calcium. One is that calcium is inherently slow, uh, so most calcium movies are played sped up, maybe four times, five times. Um, this is actually a real-time calcium movie, and you can see that as the mouse is moving along a ball, the, these are just dots on the ball for registration, and then um, the eye the eye pupil size is being tracked. Uh, calcium is is active in some of these neurons, but it, the time course of calcium rise and fall is very, very slow compared to visual perception by the mouse. Um, so there's, it's very difficult to, to back calculate the, pat the pattern of action potentials based on a calcium, uh, based on a calcium transients. And the other 
issue with calcium is that it doesn't give you any of the inputs into a neuron. So if you want to understand how a circuit functions, for example, um, you know, this, this, hippocampal, this hippocampal neuron has thousands of inputs, and you want to understand how that neuron integrates inputs to decide on an output, um, you need to be able to see those individual inputs. Those inputs uh, take the form of, of uh, inhibitory postsynaptic potentials or excitatory postsynaptic synaptic potentials. When the excitatory postsynaptic synaptic potentials reach um, a voltage threshold in the soma, then an action potential can be generated, and that can represent the output of the neuron. Uh, but um, it's this calculation, the transformation of inputs to outputs, that, that underlies uh, circuit function. So to understand that, we would need to record both the small postsynaptic potentials as well as the fast and large action potentials. Uh, so because of that, uh, there's been a lot of work over the years to develop good voltage indicators. Um, and actually, the first voltage indicator was published in, um, in 1995, I believe, in uh, 1997, in the same year as the first calcium indicator. Uh, so voltage has been, people have wanted to do voltage for as long as they've wanted to, to visualize calcium. Um, but of course, voltage is not as widely used in neurosciences. And mostly that's due to the difficulty of imaging voltage and the difficulty of making a very fast voltage indicator. Uh, when we started this work in uh, 2012, um, all the indicators were either high gain or high speed, but not both. An example of that is here with arc light. You can see that it's actually pretty high gain. Um, it responds with a pretty large signal, um, but it's not fast enough. And so the, the actual action potentials uh, that you can record with an electrode are actually filtered out or not seen uh, in the fluorescence trace. So we, um, Francois St. Pierre, who was a postdoc in the lab, um, took on the challenge of making a GCAM style voltage indicator. Um, we, we did this by fusing a circularly permitted GFP into the outside of a voltage sensing domain. Uh, and we chose this position because it's, it was predicted based on simulations to undergo a large conformational change upon a membrane depolarization. And that's because the fourth transmembrane helix of a voltage sensing domain moves up with depolarization. And that causes a change in the conformation of this, uh, of this loop between the S3 and S4 helices. And so indeed, we find that um, uh, this, this construct exhibits a large fluorescence change with depolarization. So from in, the, in the physiological range from minus 70 to plus 30, it has about a 20% drop. And importantly, it's very well expressed in the membrane. Um, so previous voltage indicators had trouble getting to the membrane, but this one is very nicely expressed. And its kinetics are very fast. So at room temperature, uh, the, the um, activation and inactivation time constants are two milliseconds. And at, room, and at body temperature, they're less than one millisecond. So that means they're fast enough to keep up with the action potentials themselves, which have kinetics of about one millisecond. And then in the subsequent years, we've improved it further. Uh, Maria uh, developed a method to do automated uh, um, screening by, by electroporation and imaging. She also developed a method to uh, build libraries without using bacteria by just creating genes by PCR and directly transfecting the PCR products into mammalian cells. So that allowed us to screen really quickly. Uh, and we typically screen two positions at a time and mutate to all 20 amino acids. That's 400 combinations. We choose positions that we believe are important for the tuning uh, of, the, of the protonation state of the chromophore. So from this, we, we got ASAP3, um, which uh, which responds with about a 45% change in the physiological range, so about twice as good as ASAP-1. Uh, uh, and then in collaboration with uh, Stéphane Dudonet's lab in Paris, uh, we were able to use ASAP-3 to image in single trials uh, over multiple days um, neurons in, in freely behaving uh, head-fixed mice. Uh, so th the reason that um, this works so well is because Stéphane, as some of you know, um, is one of the leaders in random access microscopy, uh, multi full time microscopy. And so with, uh, with random access microscopy, one can conserve uh, the time, one can conserve the, the time and the photons uh, onto points of interest in your field of view instead of, instead of the entire uh, two-dimensional field. Uh, with two photon, this is very important because as you know, two photon has to perform a raster scan throughout the field. So if you, in the traditional two photon, most of that space is empty space. Um, so you're just wasting the time and the photons. With voltage, you need to image at 1,000 frames per second. 
um, there's no way you can image uh, 1,000 by 1,000 points or 500 by 500 points in a millisecond. Uh, so you must conserve your, your excitation time onto points of interest. So random access allows that. And, um, and now uh, Stefan can image uh, in, on the order of about a dozen neurons at, um, at sufficient speed at 1,000 hertz um, and obtain all the action potentials. So here you could see that the same neuron on day one, two, and three uh, exhibits the same pattern of action potentials, and you can get a very nice sort of average, uh, average AP waveform. Uh, we've continued to improve ASAP, so now we're on ASAP uh, 4. Uh, ASAP 4 inverts the response from a negative response to a positive response. So many people ask, can we make a positive responding indicator like GCAMP? Um, yes, you can. So by changing the position of uh, hydrogen bond donors and receptors near the chromophore, we're able to change this, the relationship of chromophore pronation to, uh, to voltage. And so now we have an upward or a positive going uh, voltage indicator. So in, in ASAP4E, uh, we see about uh, a 240% response from minus 70 to plus 30, uh, and about a 500% response overall. So this actually compares quite nicely to, say, early GCAMP variants, like GCAMP3, which is about a five-fold response overall. Uh, and um, ASAP4E at, at um, body temperature is able to, uh, is, is able to detect action potentials uh, with higher uh, delta F over F uh, than ASAP3. And what's nice about ASAP4 is it's uh, quite resistant to right, quite resistant to photo bleaching. So here we've imaged uh, the same neuron for 45 seconds continuously, um, and we're still able to get. Um, uh, we don't see dis any discernible photo bleaching, and we're still able to, to visualize spikes with good SNR um, at the end. Uh, so. Now, Z's lab, in collaboration with us, um, looked at both voltage and calcium at the same time. And so this, is, I think, is the first time in vivo we've seen the relationship of voltage to calcium. Uh, so I was saying that calcium was slow. Um, and so this actually gives you a nice idea. Uh, every time there's a, there's a spike detected by voltage, um, you see a little red blip. And yet, as you can see, a single action potentials are, um, are correlated with uh, changes in calcium. Those, those changes in calcium can actually be quite small. Um, they're small in amplitude, but they're long-lived. Um, so as, here's another example. There's a spike in a calcium blip that's quite small. Uh, it's when you have, it's when you have uh, uh, um, trains of spikes or bursts of spikes that you get a larger, uh, that you get a larger calcium transient. Um, so you might, see, you might see an example here. So that's probably a triplet of spikes, and you get a large calcium transient. Uh, so just, this is just another Excel that went to the same protocol. Um, so you can see examples where there's clearly a spike and, um, and calcium is barely detectable. So most of the calcium activity we do see with GCAMP, um, like, like these, these large transients are actually uh, due, to, due to AP bursting. All right, so, um, so finally I'll end this part with a little bit of unpublished data. Um, we think that the next the next challenge in voltage imaging is to detect those inputs with as high voltage resolution as possible. And the, the, ultimate, the ultimate need, or the ultimate, uh, um, yeah, I would say the, the final, the final mm, figure of merit, actually, uh, is the ability to detect a single, um, the voltage deflection from a single synaptic vesicle. And so those are, you know, those are considered mini, miniature EPSPs. Um, classically, they're defined by electrophysiology. If you put on TTX and block the, the generation of act potentials, you get spontaneous single vesicle release. Um, that gives you a postsynaptic potential of about one to two millivolts read in the cell body. Um, that's the ultimate limit of detection that you would need to understand neuronal computation. Uh, so Alex in the lab developed an improved ASAP3 variant that has um, a steeper tuning curve. Um, so that allows us a larger delta F for a very small, for small delta Vs uh, near the resting membrane potential. And this just happens to be a neuron that, it's not patched, but it's a neuron that uh, was in culture. And we could see that it's, it's spontaneously spiking. Um, so those little blips you see are um, action potentials in the cell. Uh, so what, uh, what Sangu did was take some human neurons, actually, and, um, and patch a neuron at the same time as imaging to the dendritic tree. So in this example, 
with, with electrophysiology, we could see clearly there's some action potentials, but there are also some um, miniature sized uh, EPSPs as well. So for example, here, if you look carefully, you see a little blip. Um, and it's not noise, actually. Um, and uh, so one thing is our, our, our recordings are, are quite noise-free. EFIS recordings can be very noise-free. But also, you can see that if you follow, um, if you look in the dendrites, this blip at the cell body it correlates with a, a larger EPSP in the distal dendrite. So what's happening here is that the, the synaptic vesicle is being released at the distal dendrite. And the voltage is being propagated passively to the cell body, where it's now detected as a you know, one or two millivolt deflection by EFIS. Uh, here's another example where we see something similar, but it comes from the other branch. And, and I should note that here in this example, in the first example, we don't see it in the second branch. So that assigns the event to the, this branch, the left branch. Whereas on the right example, uh, we see it only in the rightward branch. So that assigns the, uh, that assigns the, the synaptic release event to the, to the right branch. So that suggests that we can indeed see uh, uh, synaptic events. And finally, uh, by putting on TTX, uh, we, block the, we block any large uh, release events. We get only miniature EPSPs. Uh, and here, you can see that the miniature EPSPs are about 1 to 3 millivolts in amplitude. And we can follow that with um, uh, 1 to 3 percent changes in, in the fluorescence as well. So we're getting about a 1 percent delta F over F for every one millivolt of voltage. Uh, so we're hopeful that this will be useful. Um, we think for sure it'll be useful in cell culture, for example, for phenotyping neurons with different uh, mutations. Uh, but we hope it'll be useful in vivo as well for people studying dendritic integration. All right, so the quick summary about voltage is that we have ASAP4 now that enables single trial detection of APs um, with about tenfold temporal resolution, better temporal re resolution in calcium imaging. Uh, we have ASAP5 that en enables single trial detection of EPSPs and IPSPs to one millivolt in vitro. Um, and um, now I can move on to this last half of the talk. Let me just see how, how we're doing on time. All right. Okay, so in the last part of the talk, um, I'll describe our our re research on using GFP not for imaging and not for reporting, but for controlling biological activities. Um, but for the most part, this uses a microscope. And so it is still uh, within the realm of microscopy. And so that is a spatial temporal control um, of in exogenous endogenous proteins with GFP. So one question that you, that one general question in biology is how are large structures built? How are organs built? Um, how is the nervous system built? Um, I put up this picture of uh, the Amiens Cathedral because when I was in high school, I really wanted to be an architect. And so I would spend my spare time in the library looking at, look, actually looking at pic photos of cathedrals. Um, and this is one of my favorites. I, cathedral aficionados would know it has the highest, it has the highest nave, it's the tallest cathedral. Um, but, you know, we know how cathedrals are built. They're built block by block from the ground up. And a similar, you know, a similar process would occur in organs. It has to be built cell by cell from the ground up. So, for example, a circuit, how does a circuit form um, from individual neurons? Well, we have microscopy to tell us that, um, that in the case of the nervous system, circuits form because axons are guided to their targets. And so you could see that um, at very specific locations, axons will turn. Uh, and we know now that this process is, is guided by um, the expression of, of proteins on the surface of the axons um, in their targets. This was actually a, a topic I had investigated as a student in Mike Greenberg's lab, uh, working on signaling from F, um, F receptors. So the ligands of F receptors are efferins. Um, and as you can see here, when, when you stimulate a retinal ganglion cell growth cone with efferins, you see this retraction, immediate retraction of the, um, of the growing tip or the growth cone of the axon. And what's very obvious here is that when the growth cone retracts, um, it actually removes, it's removed from the substrate. So there's a deadhesion event going on. I think that's indisputable. Um, and we know from a variety of work in neurons and non-neuronal cells that uh, small GDPases of the row family, CDC42, RAC, and row A, 
uh, are involved in forward migration. So um, CDC42 forms Philopodia, RAC forms Lambapodia, Row A um, mediates contractility and adhesion. But in the case of efferens, um, we and other groups had shown that efferent stimulation causes the activation of row A. Um, and this is a very reproducible result. Um, but there were two things that were a little bit bothersome about this. One was that the kinetics of row A activation were actually slow. So the row A peak, row A activation peaks at 20 minutes, whereas this effect is, a, is apparent in just a, a, a couple of minutes. And the other problem was that rho A was known by cell biologists to promote adhesion rather than de-adhesion. So was this activation rho A causing this de-adhesion that we see? If it isn't, then there will be some other important signal. So one of the things we did in, uh, in my lab when we worked on FRET reporters was um, we re-investigated this, this question for the kinetics. So we, we made a rho A, an improved rho A reporter using Clover and MRuby2 and then we uh, stimulated uh, hippocampal neurons with efferin. And indeed, we could see actually that rho A was activated in the growth cone uh, in just three minutes after efferin, whereas in the cell body, it took about 20 minutes. So that actually, this reconciles, this shows you one of the advantages of imaging. You could see at, in real time and in, in particular locations where a signal was occurring, whereas with the Western blot, we could never see um, just the just the growth cone signal. We, we could not see the early growth cone signal. It was swamped out by the cell body signal. All right, so at least row A is active in the right place and time. But we still have this problem where um, in the cell biology fields, row A is more known for promoting adhesion than for causing its loss. And this goes back to the famous work of Alan Hall, uh, injecting activated row and seeing the formation of larger uh, focal adhesions. So just as we needed spatial temporal protein specific sensing to see where and when rho A was active, it would be nice to have spatial temporal protein specific control to control where and when rho is active. And then we can ask, can rho A under some circumstances mediate de-adhesion? So um, our lab has been interested in developing methods for optical control but we want to do it not based on natural proteins. And so there are many natural proteins that maybe some of you here have used to control biochemistry in, cel in cellulo. Um, those are um, the love domain from um, phototropin, uh, phytochrome domains, um, gigantia, FKF domains, or cry cryptochrome domains. Um, but what we wanted to do was could not be solved using those domains. What we want to do is make a single chain photoswitchable protein. So we wanted to take a protein of interest and cage it with two domains, A and B. Um, but we wanted A and B association to be photo dissociable. That way, if you activate the dissociation of A and B with light, you would end up activating the protein of interest. You would open it up. It's a very simple idea. Um, and if if A and B were reversibly photoswitchable or bidirectionally photoswitchable, then you can use light to put on pulses of activation of the protein of interest and then withdraw its activation. So no natural protein works this way. Um, but um, uh, we started this project when we realized that the GFP DROMPA um, is a good candidate for a protein that you can engineer into a photodissociable domain. And that's because DROMPA undergoes a cis-trans isomerization as it switches from a 500 nanometer absorbing form to a non-fluorescent but 400 nanometer absorbing form. And this cis-trans isomerization is associated with a loss of structure along this side of the beta barrel of the GFP. And we realized that this side of the beta barrel of the GFP was the main dimeric interface in coral, coral-derived fluorescent proteins, of which DROMPA is a, is a member. So Xin, as a first-year grad student in the lab, asked whether we could uh, make this dimerization domain photoregulatable. Uh, so the idea was, so what she did was just try to strengthen that domain. We ended up making a tetramer, so a single mutation made in a tetramer. And then what Xin found was that, we, that this tetramer was photodissociable and could be reassociated with another wavelength of light. So specifically, if we run this DROMPA 145N on non-denaturating gel, um, it runs as a tetramer next to a tetrameric fluorescent protein. When we shine cyan light, it becomes a monomer. 
we can now shine violet light on that monomer, and now it runs back as a tetramer. <clears throat> but we, what we really wanted was a dimer. So with further work, um, we were able to create, we were able to strengthen the dimer interface that we want and eliminate the dimer interface we didn't want. So now we have bright, stable dimers that can be switched to dark monomers and then back into bright dimers um, with two different wavelengths of light. All right, and so then um, we tested this idea out using kinases because kinases um, are involved in so much of cell biology. And so this is a model for what a cage kinase would look like. We fuse a drompa domain to the N-terminus, another one to the FG loop. We, we choose that position so that the, the binding of the dimer would occlude the active site. And this is just a model of what it might look like. Um, so you can see that the two drompa domains are actually quite big. That will uh, prevent any substrate from accessing the, the active site until, until the dissociation happens. And indeed, we found that um, by using MEC as a, as a test case, we're able to make a, make a photo switchable MEC uh, where photo activation leads to um, activity of MEC as assayed by phosphorylation of, of a substrate ERK that's just as, as strong as uh, serum stimulation. So we can recapitulate the entire dynamic range of the mech erc pathway. All right, so back to this problem then. Um, how can we use photo switching to understand functions of rho? Uh, so this is work done by Jihei, who was a postdoc and then now is her, um, runs her own lab. So we made a photo switchable um, PS rho gef. So uh, we made a photo switchable rho gef, which we call PS rho gef. Uh, this is based on PDZ rho gef. It's one of the natural activators of rho A. So it's a guanine nucleotide exchange factor for rho A. Um, we've, we put the two drumpa domains at the N and C termini of the catalytic domain to cage it. And then we place the entire protein at, this, at the membrane with the, with the foreign isolation signal. So the idea is that at rest, it's inactive. With 500 nanometer light, it's active. And it will work just like a native gef uh, to activate rho A. So in this case, we don't need to put in more rho A, all the rho A is endogenous. Uh, and we can see with um, different amounts of light, we can activate different amounts of rho A GDP. Uh, so first thing we did was to put rho, photo switch rho GEF into growth cones, and we can see that with photo activation of growth cone, uh, we indeed get retraction. Uh, so this shows that rho activation, again, is sufficient uh, for growth cone retraction. So that it allows rho A to be a mediator of growth cone retraction events. Um, and now we have the question of why is it sometimes adhesive and why is it sometimes uh, anti-adhesive? So here we see that rho A activation is sufficient to induce de-adhesion uh, in a, in a non-neuronal cell. Uh, so here this is a life act M cardinal stain, so we're looking at actin. You can see that it starts out with a lot of uh, focal adhesions at this edge, uh, but after photoactivation of, of PS rho GEF, those focal adhesions are dissolved. So there's clearly a de-adhesive event going on. You can see that here as well. So indeed, you can get de-adhesion with rho A activation. But how do we reconcile this with the fact that rho A seems to be promoting focal adhesion growth in many contexts? Well, what we see is that actually um, the focal adhesion loss is maximal, not at maximal rho A activation, but at an intermediate amount. And as to remind you, we're not putting in row, we're not putting in more row A. So all the row A, the row A amount is limited by the native by the native um, levels. And so what, what we're seeing here is that activation of submaximal native row A um, is causing de-adhesion, but not at maximal levels. In fact, at maximal levels, we see a little bit of focal adhesion growth. So what we think is that um, uh, row A signals differently at intermediate levels versus maximal levels. And we find that the signaling, the difference in signaling is SARC. Um, so for example, if we, um, if we put on um, a SARC inhibitor, we no longer get the loss of focal adhesions. Um, and if we, uh, if we put on, um, uh, and if we put on um, high row A, um, you can get adhesion growth. So instead of getting so that you can accentuate the adhesion growth in the presence of, in the absence of SARC. Um, and then finally, we see that um, SARC, a SARC FRET reporter is selectively activated by um, submaximal levels of row A activation. So this gives us um, uh, this model where intermediate level of row A um, activates SARC, 
uh, and that causes focal adhesion disassembly. And we think what's happening with a high with high row A is we don't activate SARC. Instead, perhaps we activate more of this um, uh, the contractile arm of row A signaling, and that causes focal adhesion growth. So to summarize our findings here, what we believe is that um, that PS row gaps reveal dosage requirements for row A and focal adhesion growth. And this is enabled by the fact that we can use this um, photoswitchable single chain, uh, uh, single chain uh, PS row GEF. All right, so in the very final few minutes, I'll tell you about um, a story that we're really excited about. It's, it, we haven't talked about it anywhere else. Um, and I think it's, it addresses the final frontier in optical control. And that is how do you control endogenous proteins? I sort of gave you an example of controlling endogenous rho, but we're putting in an additional, in that case, we're putting in additional copies of the PS rho GEF. Can we control endogenous proteins without putting in any active protein, right? Can we, do, can we just control the endogenous population? So the way you can do it is by making optically controllable antibody mimetics. Right, so there are these nanobodies, afibodies, different kinds of bodies that you can, you can select, you can mutate and select for binding to virtually any protein target. And you can make bodies that um, inhibit protein targets. So you, you at least have an inhibitor. So now if we can make those inhibitors photo switchable, we would have a generalizable way of inhibiting any endogenous protein at any time and place. So to do this inside a cell, we want um, uh, we want a scaffold that's in popular use so we can just pull from existing examples. Uh, it has to not use disulfide, so that rules out um, single chain FVs, for example. And we want a concave peritope. So the peritope is the part of the protein that's evolved to bind the epitope. We want it to be concave because, as you, as you can see with the DROMPA for the switchable proteins, we need a concave surface around which we can create the cage. So um, we decided to use DARPINs as a solution. So DARPINs, maybe some of you have used them. Um, they were developed by Andreas Pluckton. He started a company named Molecular um, Partners that, um, that uh, makes DARPINs for other big pharma companies. And during the pandemic, they had made a SARS-CoV-2 spike protein binder. Uh, and they had shown actually that this DARPIN binder, binder a trimeric form, uh, was higher affinity than any natural monoclonal antibodies. It was more resistant variants until Omicron came along and then that, that also escaped from, from the DARPINs. Well, so one issue with the DARPINs is that they, have, they meet all the above requirements, but one problem was that the natural NNC termini, the natural C terminus is over here, the natural NNC termini is around the same side of the protein. So you can actually create a dimer of DROMPA and not actually cage the peritope. So Michael Westberg, um, postdoc in the lab who's now in, in Denmark, um, used uh, Rosetta to add an additional uh, helix to the C terminus of DARPIN that now creates um, a cross topology between the N terminal and the C terminal of the DARPIN. And that, that assures that any uh, DROMPA dimer will form in front of the peritope and not fall in back of the page, for example. So that is the DROMPAs will now be in front of the page, uh, which is the side the peritope is on. So we've, we've done this and we've showed that it worked with GFP. Um, we showed it worked with, um, uh, with MEC as a target. I'm gonna show you an example where we use this to inhibit RAS in a, sp in a temporally controlled manner. So the, the experiment will involve um, using ERK KTR reporters. Uh, so just a, just a brief overview of ERK KTR reporters. They're phosphorylated by ERK. Um, and when they're phosphorylated, a nuclear localization signal is, um, uh, is abolished. And so a nuclear export signal takes over. So in the presence of ERK, the KTR is actually outside the nucleus. We're gonna have a photoswitchable DARPIN in, that's gonna target RAS. If the DARPIN is not active, then, uh, and we're using a cell line EGF that expresses EGFRV3, ERK will be constitutively active and the um, KTR will be outside the nucleus. Once we activate the DARPIN with light, RAS should be inhibited, ERK should be inhibited downstream, and then the uh, KTR should go back into the nucleus. Oh, that's what I was just showing here, yes. Um, and as you recall, it's, uh, these 
these dark, these trumpas are photostretchable bidirectionally. So we're going to use both wavelengths of light. So here we first activate the RAS, um, anti-RAS uh, DARPEN. So KTR is starting outside, this, outside the nucleus. Once we activate the DARPEN, we expect RAS to be inhibited, ERK to be inhibited, and the KTR to go back into the nucleus. And indeed, we see that. And now if we recage the DARPEN, uh, then RAS should be reactivated, ERK should be reactivated, and the ERK KTR should go out of the nucleus. So we, um, we recage the, the, DARP, the DARPIN, which you can see by the re resumption of DRAMPA fluorescence. And now you see, the, um, you see some of the um, uh, KTR go outside the nucleus. So um, the quantification over 18 cells looks like that. All right, so we can inhibit RAS. Um, and now we can ask a question that people in the RAS field have been debating for a long time, which is, does late RAS signaling matter? So if you look at the RAS pathway, <clears throat> you, can, you can make a case that late signaling matters. You can also make a case that late signaling doesn't matter. So for example, you could say that um, once, let's pretend this is wild type EGFR, so it needs a ligand. Once you activate EGF, EGFR with EGF, uh, RAS is going to be activated and then it's going uh, it's to um, lead to phosphorylation of ERK. The question is, does, this, does RAS need to be there? You can make a case that it needs to be there because dephosphorylation of ERK um, happens too quickly. So you always need RAS to activate RAF to activate MEC and ERK. But you can also make the case that um, you just need to set this off and that this is self-sustaining, that the phosphatases are, are too slow or that there's a positive feedback loop. And so this has been a hot topic of debate because, especially because EGFR is endocytosed upon, upon EGF activation, and people have been wondering whether the endocytose forms a uh, signal or not. So to address this question, we can use our photoswitchable RAS inhibitor. We can use it basically like a RAS uh, antagonist drug, but there are no good RAS antagonists, but we can now do this with a photoswitchable binder. So first we just do the uh, control experiment with, no, with a GFP binder. So this is a negative control. Um, we put on EGF, and you can look at ERK KTR. It goes outside of the nucleus, right? So the ERK pathway is being activated. Uh, we can put on 488 nanometer light to activate the anti-GFP DARPEN. It's an inert DARPEN, so nothing happens. And uh, we just can continue to accumulate ERK KTR outside the nucleus. Now we can do this with the RAS binder. Same thing, but now with the RAS binder. Um, we activate EGF, or KTR goes outside the nucleus. We activate the RAS binder. And you can see right away that the ERK KTR goes back into the nucleus. So actually, it's a very, very strong effect. And this, this demonstrates that active RAS signaling is required. And actually, quite, quite a lot of active RAS signaling is required. Without active RAS, the system has a half-life of only about uh, 10 minutes. So I think, at least in this cell line, uh, the photoswitchable RAS DARPEN allows us to settle, to settle this debate, and I think quite unambiguously. So in summary, we've created a single-chain photoswitchable DARPEN, PS DARPEN, that allows control of endogenous RAS and ERK. I didn't show ERK, but it's very similar results. And then because DARPENs can be selected to bind essentially any protein, the function of we think any endogenous protein can now be dynamically tested. So that's it. I've taken you through two stories. One is voltage imaging with GFP, which we think is an extreme case of fluorescent protein engineering. Um, and the second one is we believe that uh, the uses of GFP and of microscopes extend beyond just imaging and sensing. Uh, we can now use those same tools uh, to understand the dynamic functions of proteins in living cells. Um, and with that, I'll thank the people who did their work. Um, they're shown here. I've shown some of them along the way. Um, and um, we have great collaborators to help us in, in, different, um, in different tasks and uh, funding from the NIH and NSF. Uh, and once again, I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. So maybe I can start with uh, to let them time to think about it. Uh, I was wondering, you showed we, uh, with us a pure voltage dye, uh, uh, nice dynamics, and uh, you say that you, we, can, uh, we can access even to the minis, which is uh, wonderful news. And I was wondering, um, w would you think it would be possible to have double color yeah, at one term? To have, uh, let's say, the, the electric activity on, uh, of the axon on one color and of the dendrite on, on the other color? So 
Oh, right, like two colors for the voltage. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we've done a little bit of work on a red voltage indicator. Um, you know, red, red indicators are always harder than the green indicators, and I think many of us are, are, are familiar with that. Um, and it's, it's, it's true for voltage as well. So, you know, we've tried pretty hard, and we have, we have, we have, we have small responses, but, you know, nothing that we think is usable yet. So it's going to require quite a bit of work. Um, I think if you're looking in two locations, you already have the, you could do the experiment with just one wavelength because you have the two locations to look at. Um, you know, there are, and there are, are actually red voltage indicators based on the opsins, which don't require f fluorescent protein engineering, where the fluorescent protein is a FRET acceptor for the opsin, and the opsin undergoes, a, undergoes a, an absorbance change. Mm -hmm. um, actually, sorry, the, the, the fluorescent proteins are FRET donors for the opsin, and the, ops, and the opsins undergo a fluorescent change. So, um, so that's, um, so that it is actually doable, um, not with, not with, we don't have a VSD based red, but you could do it with an opsin. The problem with the opsins is, uh, they don't, they don't respond so well in two photon. Um, and so if you, so you can only do the experiment in one photon mode, but it, it can be done. Okay. But even in one photon, it could be great. <laughs> yes. Even one photon is good. <laughs> okay. Any question? Yes. Yeah, thanks for a beautiful talk. I have a thanks. general question about your uh, sensor design. It seems that uh, a lot of the sensor design strategies uh, actually uh, tend to control the protonation state of the GFP chromophore. Yes which then brings potential uh, additional sensitivity to pH. Yes. So I was wondering whether this might sometimes bring difficulties to your experiments and if there are also maybe other strategies that are envisageable to not yes. have this additional pH effect. Yes. Yeah, thanks for the question. Yeah, um, that is absolutely right. So all the circularly permeated fluorophores are pK based. Right, so the um, so they all are they all are modulating the protonation state. Right, so the deprotonated chromophore is um, absorbs at 488. The, the protonated chromophore absorbs at 500. I mean, sorry, 400. And so um, and so that's how we get this really nice dynamic range for all the CP GFP based indicators. Uh, for voltage. For voltage especially, we, we haven't run into a problem, we haven't run into a case where that's a problem because the voltage responses are so fast. That is, the voltage responses are much faster than any pH responses. Right, so again, um, yeah, so the, your point is absolutely correct that this chromophore is gonna get deprotonated and protonated in response to voltage change. It can also, of course, be, that pronation percent is gonna be shifted as the pH of the solution changes. But um, you know, voltage, of course, is changing out with one millisecond time courses. pH in the extracellular environment, uh, where the where the GFP is, um, we don't expect to change very quickly, right? So, so we're not in a situation typically with this reporter um, where it matters. Uh, people have actually seen this, I think, with long amounts, long periods of firing in neurons with GCAMPs because GCAMPs are intracellular. But even then, most of the time. With GCAMPs is not an issue because you, you know, you can you can have a you can have a drifting baseline. And you could still see the activity. I think where it matters more would be something like a kinase, where you might then worry that you make a, a single chain CP GFP based kinase indicator, and you're looking at response of a kinase over an hour. If it's a metabolically um, active kinase, it can very well change the pH of the cell. Um, so it's an excellent point. So. But to, to answer your question about whether it can be done, whether you can make indicators that are not CP or not PKA-based, uh, yes, you can, right? There are indicators, FRET indicators are not PKA-based, but they tend to have smaller dynamic ranges. There are indicators um, like RCAMP1 that happens not to be a pronation event, it happens to be a quantum yield event. And actually, there's some evidence with ASAP that is both the pronation event and a quantum yield change. Um, but it, generally, the quantum yield based indicators are much fewer when they were made they were made accidentally um, it's harder to it's harder to think of how to modify the quantum yield in a very very robust manner like you know in, the, in these tenfold twentyfold uh, 
dynamic range is. But thanks for the question. Oh, yeah, we had a question here Hi. Yeah. while you get the microphone. Yes. So I have any question, but I was wondering in the second part of your talk, if you managed to inhibit proteins that are in the nucleus, for example, or in small compartments in the cell. Uh, in the, the photoswitchable proteins. Uh, the question was, what about small compartments? Like if you have a protein that is packed in a small cellular compartment or in the nucleus, can you inhibit it? Uh, can you pass through membranes, for example, from the, the nuclear pores? The question is whether we can we can only photoactivate in small compartments. Is that right? No, no. Sir? In the second part of your talk, when you inhibited uh, your MEK and, 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 and SARC, uh, it was in the cytoplasm. But what about uh, protein that would be localized in smaller compartments with less accessibility? Oh, right, right. Yes, you can do that. We haven't. Um, yeah, we haven't really localized things anywhere else other than the me membrane. Um, but yeah, that's a really Yes, yeah, so definitely that's one of the other advantages, of course, of having a photo, I mean, a genetically encoded um, controller as you can put it different places. Um, and then, you know, I answered the question you didn't ask, which is, you know, can, can we activate locally? Yeah, we can, but we actually haven't yet in terms of for the, for the photo, um, for the photo switchable ROGAF. But that's another, another thing, of course, that you can do. But my, my question was uh, related to that one, so great talk. Uh, because you know you will activate or inhibit locally a protein, but it will diffuse away and will be replaced by activated or inhibited protein. So could you activate at one location and inhibit at another one in the same cell? Oh, right, yeah, actually we did do that for, um, so the very first paper back in 2015, um, we, we made a photo switchable CDC42 GAF and we actually did Inhibit it everywhere and activate only in one place, and so that gives you very, yeah, very local activation. Uh, and that was a case where we didn't want the spreading of the effect, so we wanted to confine it to one part of the cell. Uh, 